and uh, it's so good to be on God's side right now. And I want to start off this morning reading a story to you. Is that okay? I guess it doesn't matter. I'm going to read it anyway. <laughs> Are you ready? The car was careening down the ridiculously steep hill without any brakes. As the rounded curves, their speed was so high, it seemed they were going to flip. The passengers were screaming f f frantically, praying that somehow they might be delivered from the seemingly hellish experience. One individual was even crying. Near the bottom of the hill, the car flipped upside down. Over and over, it continued to somersault while the disoriented passengers tried to hold on for dear life, unsure of their fate. Yet one man was laughing hysterically, celebrating profusely, as if he was having the time of his life. Suddenly, the, star st the car stopped flipping, and an unseen force slowed the car and immediately brought it to a stop. All of the passengers exclaimed, I've never ridden a roller coaster that was this exciting. Amen. Did you think it was something else? Who knew it was a roller coaster? Amen. The moral. Many live in fear of what they can't personally control. While some trust the designer of the ride that they'll be kept safe. I trust the designer right now. How about you? I can't totally control what's going on. Oh, I can play a part. But some things are beyond my direct influence. But I'm going to celebrate the designer. And I'm going to celebrate profusely. Have the time of my life no matter what's going on. I had the dream uh, several years back. Not the dream, the vision of a, of a speedboat going up this river at top speed full of remnant revivalists having a time of their life. I've told this dream many times. They're celebrating. The boat's full of coolers of non-alcoholic drink, drinks. And they have no problems. They have joy. But as I look behind the boat, the entire earth is opening up and swallowing the river. And everything on the banks is caving in. Foam's going 100 feet in the air. And it's total devastation and destruction. Now, I've hoped for years I could pray that off. I was hopeful that we wouldn't see the destruction that I saw in that, in that vision. But I'm not sure right now whether we are or not. All I know is, is God's got our back. He's got us safe. And a few weeks ago, I drew this chart on the board, this uh, graph, where the vertical axis represents the liberty of Christianity, especially in, in this nation. How much liberty do we have? Freedom of speech, freedom of expression, freedom of religion, right? Uh, here's time on the horizontal axis as we're going out in time. And I label this right now, that we're at this level of liberty, a very high level in, in, in America. Right now in America, you can preach about Jesus and not worry about somebody shooting you for the most part, right? But we know in this election, those that have been put in power hate Christianity. They would shut it down if they could in a minute. And you're going to start seeing if they're kept in power for however long. Uh, you will start seeing laws, edicts declared. You try to start to throttle the power of the revivalist church. They may leave the religious church alone. There'll be efforts to try to shut down those in revival. Those that are really going after God. And I show this plummet of, of what I call a, a fall into persecution that could take place. But according to that speedboat vision, no matter how, how hard, the, how much persecution we come under, God's got our backs. And I believe it will initiate a time of collapse. To what level, I don't know. Hopefully low when we come out of this. But we know that God's going to deliver us from this through an awakening, through a revival. And we're going to soar back into liberty we've never known before. Signs and wonders coming forth. The harvest coming in. God's going to turn it around. And I've shown several lines on this chart because I don't know when the turnaround is going to come. Now, I was hoping it would be before the election, before the inauguration. That line's gone. Now we're coming down the hill to see when is this turnaround going to take place? How much persecution will the church undergo before we see a turnaround, right? 
But no, on this downward thrust, we're on the motorboat. Amen. Nothing, no weapon formed against us shall prosper. Turn with me to Isaiah chapter 65. Isaiah 65. And I want to read a set of verses out of this. Have you got it? Verse number one. I am sought of them that ask not for me. I am found of them that sought me not. I said, Behold me. Behold me unto a nation that was not called by my name. In other words, he's talking about the Gentiles. God said there will be Gentiles that will rise up and seek me, a nation that I didn't call, didn't call out for, right? That didn't call out for me. I've spread out my hands all the day unto a rebellious people. Now, this would be talking about Israel in this case, or even uh, dead Christianity today. I've spread my arms out to a rebellious people. I want to gather them. Which walketh in a way that was not good after their own thoughts, thoughts, plans, and purposes, right? A people that provoketh me to anger continually to my face, that sacrifices in gardens and burneth incense upon altars of brick. In other words, they're celebrating, they're worshiping things other than God. Isn't it amazing how quickly Kentucky basketball has fallen out of grace. God's bringing idols down right now. What are they? Five and nine, some five and ten, something like that. And, and uh, bow to the national anthem, including the coach. You know, it's people are burning stuff right now uh, of UK uh, memorabilia, which remain among the graves. In other words, what they're doing is got them surrounded by the dead, dead activities, dead results, and lodge in the monuments. They want to worship to revivals of the past or moves of God that took place centuries ago or millennium ago versus find out what God's doing now. Which eat swine's flesh and the and broth of abominable things is in their vessels. They eat pork. Now, let me say this right now. In the New Testament, God took restrictions off of our diet. You can eat pork now, especially around us, because they almost wiped out trichinosis. And we know how to cook it well, right? And I like ribs. <laughs> but we don't have any food restrictions of God now as far as it being sin. Maybe unhealthy, but not a sin. It says... Now, for us to eat swine's flesh or abominable things would be we're filling our, our mind, our eyes, our, our, our sense gates with wicked stuff. Amen. You're partaking of the wrong inputs, listening to the wrong voices. As a Christian, if you tune into CNN, you're eating swine's flesh. Amen. If you read the Herald Leader, you're eating abominable things. And, of course, not to mention what you can take off the Internet, right? And even Fox News has become questionable. Verse 5, which say, Stand by thyself, come not near to me, for I am holier than thou. These are a smoke in my nose and a fire that burneth all the day. In other words, they're saying, Don't come around me, you're unclean. I can't be around certain people because they're the wrong influence. Amen. How many of those lot of people afraid to be around you? Oh, they speak in tongues. They believe in the power of God. They believe that God can still turn the election around. They don't want to hear what you've got to say. Amen. That's why they're so vocal online when you try to post something conservative. They've got to try to attack it back. They can't stand an opposing voice. It says, Behold, it is written before me. I will not keep silence, but will recompense, even recompense it into their bosom. Your iniquities and the iniquities of your fathers together, saith the Lord, which shall burn incense upon the mountains and blaspheme me upon the hills. 
Therefore will I measure their former work into their bosom. In other words, God says, I'm going to pay them back for their wickedness. Thus saith the Lord, as the new wine is found in the cluster, and one saith destroy, or destroy it not, for a blessing is in it, so will I do for my servant's sakes, that I may not destroy them all. Now God says, even though there's wickedness in the nation, there's some that are good. Some are, are, are worth redemption. I'll not destroy all of them. And I will bring forth a seed out of Jacob and out of Judah an inheritance of my mountains and mine, mine elect shall inherit it. And my servants shall dwell there. God says, I've got a group. I'm going to elevate above the storms. And Sharon shall be a fold of flocks and the valley of Achor a place for the herds to lie down in. For my people that have sought me. But you are they that forsake. Now he's talking to the wicked again. You, ye are they that forsake the Lord, that forget my holy mountain, that prepare a table for that troop and furnish the drink offering unto the, that number. Therefore will I number you to the sword. God's going to deal with the wicked. And ye shall all bow down to the slaughter. This is not just a little bit of a, you know, a light purging. He calls it a slaughter. That's what I saw with the destruction. It was a slaughter. Because when I called, you did not answer. When I spake, you did not hear. But did evil before mine eyes, and did choose that wherein I delighted not. We're seeing the wicked now. Not only has so-called President Biden destroyed thousands of jobs, he's reinitiating things that are going to cause the unborn to be slaughtered at an even higher rate. And God's had enough of this. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, my servants shall eat. Now, who are the servants? The ones that seek God. I believe we're in that number. Amen. My servants shall eat, but you shall be hungry. Behold, my servants shall drink, but you shall be thirsty. Understand, I believe it's talking about natural food and spiritual food. In fact, I have a new name for us. I'm going to do a message on it here soon. I believe we should be called spiritual preppers. We've been preparing for some time for the storms to come. We've been prepping spiritually. Nothing wrong with spirit prepping naturally. You follow me? Have you some hamburger helper saved up or whatever? But uh, more important is prep spiritually. You learn to use your faith before it's necessary or mandatory. And you build yourself up in God and you come to know Him now, right? You don't want to be like the foolish bridesmaids who had their lamps half full. The wise virgins were spiritual preppers. Behold, my servant shall rejoice. There's the party on the boat. But you shall be ashamed. Behold, my servant shall sing for joy of heart. But you shall cry for sorrow of heart. And shall howl for vexation of spirit. See, we're seeing right here in the word a description of the motorboat situation. God's people protected and blessed, but the wicked being slaughtered, destroyed. And you shall leave your name for a curse unto my chosen. For the Lord God shall slay thee and call his servants by another name that he who blesses himself in the earth shall bless himself in the God of truth. And he that sweareth in the earth shall swear by the God of truth. Because the former troubles are forgotten and because they are hid from mine eyes. God says, I'm going to bring you a place you don't even remember the past, your former troubles. See, I believe that motorboat's not just going up the river. It's got a destination. The destination is the glory of God. The destination is the earth being redeemed from the authority of the wicked. The eighth mountain of God coming down on the other seven mind-molding mountains. It's our time. Amen. Now go to Jeremiah 23. And I've got a lot to cover this morning, so we'll just go as far as we can. But I have something I want to give out this morning now. 
How many want to be on that motorboat? I have tickets. Now, we really can't close up on the tickets, so I'm going to close up on them. Is anybody watching online right now? Pastor Rebecca, you got it up online? I don't care if they're watching or not. Is it online? I want to move us up close so people can see it. Just keep me in the center. Keep the ticket there. No, tell me which way to go. This way. Tell me when you see the ticket good. It's labeled speedboat ticket. It says admit one. You have to come in individually. You can't come in just because grandma loved Jesus, right? It's a party boat ticket for the remnant church. Proper wedding attire is reti- is required. Amen. Can't come in with the wrong garment. And on the back are a whole list of promises given to us in the scriptures. Scriptures that define what God's given to us. And it's labeled the born again holder of this ticket has been granted rights to all of the promises contained in these Bible pra- passages. I understand we all have the rights to these. So it applies via a ticket as well. So this ticket is merely a reminder of what we possess in Christ. And uh, can you pass those out to everybody? I've actually stamped the tickets to make sure you have an official copy. Praise God. I stamped the tickets. I didn't have a, a, an actual ticket stamp, so I used my professional engineering stamp, license stamp. So it's official. <laughs> Amen. And I want you to take that. You can use it for a bookmark, put it on the refrigerator, whatever you need to do to remind you, you have rights to be on a speedboat. If you seek God, if you're after the things of the kingdom, you have a right to live on that speedboat. And of course, you've got to be a person of faith. So, Jeremiah 23, have you got it? And I want to read through some of these verses. What I'm focusing on are the speedboat people. Jeremiah 23, verse 1. Woe be unto the pastors that destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, saith the Lord. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God of Israel against the pastors that feed my people. You have scattered my flock and driven them away and have not visited them. Behold, I will visit upon you the evil of your doings, saith the Lord. Now, I once know of an individual, a group of people that accused their pastor of being the one that scatters the flock because he didn't visit them. And they meant because he didn't go on home visitations. Or very few. Like somehow that's the job of the pastor to go around and visit everybody. That's not what that verse means. It means visit them with the word from God. It means and bring them into the place of knowing God. You scatter them away from God. Amen. You unite them by letting them know the God of, of covenant. Amen. And he says, and I will gather the remnant. Are you part of the remnant? I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all countries whither I've driven them and will bring them again to their folds and they shall be fruitful and increase. Now here we see that the ones that are scattering the sheep can't be pastors of the remnant. They're the ones gathering them together. Those that are preaching user-friendly messages, social club uh, sermons, are the ones scattering the sheep. They may be gathering a group, big group, but they're not bringing them to God. They've scattered them away from God. Because he says, And I will set up shepherds over them, which shall feed them, and they shall fear no more, nor be dismayed, neither shall they be lacking, saith the Lord. In other words, God says, I'm going to bring you to true shepherds, to true pastors. In fact, we're not going to read all the way through this, but then he says there's even true prophets. There are a lot of people prophesying against God. 
Amen. Speaking peace to the wicked, it says. But God's shepherds bring the remnant together to learn to have a relationship with the Most High God. It says, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch, and a king shall reign and prosper, and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. Now we see when God comes, He's going to have justice and, ju and equity, judgment. There's coming a day God deals with this plummet. I'm believing it's real soon. I'm extending my faith that it's real soon. But regardless, I'm on the voter boat for the entire cruise. Or the entire, how can I say it? Duration, escapade, whatever we want to call it. Verse 6. In his days, Judah shall be saved, and Israel shall dwell safely. And this is his name whereby he shall be called the Lord our righteousness. I'm telling you, those that are going to be on the boat come to know they've been made the righteous of God in Christ Jesus. They have rights to be come before the throne of God. Therefore, behold the days come, saith the Lord, that they shall no more say, the Lord liveth with which brought up the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. But the Lord liveth which brought up and which led the seed of the house of Israel out of the north country and from all countries whither I have driven them and they shall dwell in their own land. Now that's interesting to me. Because here God says, there's coming a day people don't reflect as God's greatest miracle being, being bringing people out of Israel. That was a great miracle. Would you say ten plagues were a great miracle? The Red Sea parting a great miracle? Manna? Quail, water from a rock, great miracles. And it says there's coming a move of God so great that people won't reflect about back on that anymore. They'll talk about this end time move of God. Now some would say it's talking about the end times. I mean talking about the millennial reign of Christ or the second heaven being created. New heavens and new earth being created. That could be. But I believe God's bringing a move like that right now. I think we're positioned as a nation right now for not just 10 plagues, maybe 20 plagues. But no, during the plagues, Israel was in the land of Goshen protected. You will be on the speedboat because you don't have a ticket. Hold up your ticket. You have a ticket to be protected. Two people held up their ticket. <laughs> Three, over there, three, over there, over there, four, five, five, five. You have a ticket to be on the ride. God's got our back. No matter what happens, no matter what he's got to do in the earth, know that you will be supplied for. He will bring you food. He will bring you drink, shelter, clothing, joy and peace. God's about to move in these situations. I believe it. Again, we know the word says that the glory is coming at a time of gross darkness on the earth. Well, it's starting to spread its wings. I mean, the darkness is starting. They think they have a liberty now. They think they have a protection. They think they will never lose another election. They're starting to show all their true colors. They're exposing all of their roots. And uh, it's time for the glory to come forth and deal with these things. Amen. Go to chapter 24. You still with me? Verse 1, the Lord showed me, and behold, two baskets of figs were set before the temple of the Lord. In other words, both these baskets have come before the temple. After that, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had carried away captive Jeconiah, the son of Jehoiakim, king. Now, this vision takes place after the captivity of Judah. Understand in, in 742 or something like that B.C. that Israel was taken captive by the Assyrians. But some 200 years later, Judah's been taken captive by the Babylonians. 
And there, that's where Daniel was under Nebuchadnezzar. Remember Daniel's experiences? And it says, after this captivity, he sees a vision about two baskets of figs. I want to present something to you right now. I have not, I have not, I have not shared this with anyone. I question whether I should right now. I've been praying that we would see President Trump go straight into the Oval Office, and not be interrupted. But throughout this time, I've been getting verses that deal with the captivity. That there would be a time of captivity. I didn't share it. I didn't proclaim it because I didn't want it to happen. I didn't want to see it. But yet I was getting those kind of verses. That before there's the remnant release, there's first the captivity. And I certainly don't want 70 years of captivity under this nonsense. I kind of like better what we read in Revelation last Thursday night. That God says you'll be captive for 10 days. <laughs> Remember Revelation chapter 2, he told the church you'll be taken captive for 10 days. That sounds better. I can deal with 10 days, not 70 years. And this curve right here represents the captivity. And what we're about to read with the two types of figs deal with a time of captivity. God dealing with different segments of the populace during a captive time. Do you follow me? Carried away captive. Jeconiah, the son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, and the princes of Judah, with the carpenters and smiths from Jerusalem, and had brought them to Babylon. One basket had very good figs. So that's me. Even like the figs that are first ripe. And, in other words, fruitful. You're good fruit. You shall know them by their fruit, right? And the other basket had very naughty figs. They were not on Santa's good list at all. Which could not be eaten. They were so bad. Then said the Lord unto me, What seest thou, Jeremiah? God's always asking you what you see. What, what, what do you perceive I'm showing you right now? God's speaking to all of us this morning. What are you seeing out of this? What are you picking up? What am I confirming within you? What seest thou, Jeremiah? And I said, figs, the good figs very good, and the evil very evil that cannot be eaten. They are so evil. Again, the word of the Lord came to me unto me, saying, Thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, Like these good figs, so will I acknowledge them that are carried away captive of Judah, whom I have sent out of this place into the land of the Chaldeans for their good. God says, I've got, I've got a protection over my people in the captivity. And they will know good even though they're taken away captive. Amen. Now, to me, this taking away captive for us, this carrying away, would be getting on a motorboat. God says, I'm getting you on this boat for your good. Remember, all aboard. For I will set mine eyes upon them for good. And I will bring them again to this land and I will build them and not pull them down and I will plant them and not pluck them up. God says, they are coming out of the captivity. Now we know they came out of the captivity in, in Judah's day through Cyrus, king of the Medes and Persians, right? Type of President Trump. I'm going to bring them out of the captivity. They're going to return again to the land. They're going to be back in power. They're going to again flourish. But no, there's a segment of time where I need you to be patient and trust me to do you good. For I will set mine eyes upon them for good, and I will bring them again to this land, and I will build them and not pull them down, and I will plant them and not pluck them up. We're coming to a place that this nonsense is over. And I will give them a heart to know me. There's the knowing God. That I am the Lord, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God. And they shall return unto me with their whole heart. And as the evil figs, uh-oh. And as the evil figs which cannot be eaten, they are so evil. That to me represents our political leadership right now. The media, the education system, the leaders on those seven mountains. 
even many of the religious leaders. Amen. Do you understand the Dominion voting machines they discovered go all the way to the Pope? The wickedness with those machines? Surely thus saith the Lord, so will I give Zedekiah the king of Judah and his princes and the residue of Jerusalem that remain in this land and then that dwell in the land of Egypt. In other words, they're God's people, but they're living in the world system of the type of Egypt. And I will deliver them to be removed into all the kingdoms of the earth for their hurt to be a reproach and a proverb, a taunt and a curse in all places where I shall drive them. God says, I'm going to drive out the wicked and they'll be mocked everywhere they go. There'll be proverbs written about them. About what it's like to rebel against the Most High God and even cheat in an election. There'll be, there will be songs written in the near future about, there'll be country songs about they cheated in the election, but God brought them down and their dog died. You know what happens when you play country music backwards, right? Your talk, dog comes back to life. Your house is rebuilt. Your marriage is restored. And all your children serve God. Amen. Moving right along. Verse 10. And I will send the sword, the famine, and the pestilence among them till they be consumed from off the land that I gave unto them and to their fathers. Now we talk about our forefathers in America. God gave us this land. And God considers this his country. And he's going to take care of the wicked who try to set up camp and rule over us. Amen. God's going to bring the sword and famine and pestilence among them. That would be everything collapsing behind the boat. Now I have concerns. The many unknowing to see people will be caught up in the collapse. Because what I saw, that's going to happen. Amen. Pray that people come to the light right now. Let out your nets to bring in harvest now to bring people out of this darkness, this deception. But those that will be with God, that will side with God right now, that will honor God and seek God, will be on a motorboat, and not a hair of their head shall be harmed. They'll have the time. We will have the time of our lives. Amen. Because you have a ticket. Now, I have not put these online for sale yet, but I know they're going to be going very expensive. You have first run. And so it'll be, don't let those go. They're going to be too valuable someday. People will be clamoring for these tickets. Now, with that in mind, turn to First Timothy with what I've been talking about in mind. I think this is what Lynn's been waiting for all morning. Could be your Facebook posts. First Timothy chapter 2. I've had people asking this question. First Timothy chapter 2 verse 1. I exhort, therefore, that first of all, primarily, initially, at the outset, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and all that are in authority, that we may live a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. I've had people saying to me, well, now we have to bow down and honor Joe Biden as our president. Whatever he says, we need to follow. Let's get in unity with these ridiculous standards they want to set. And they want to point to this verse. Yes, we should pray for them. Yeah, we should pray for them. I pray this. Father, wake them up and get them redeemed. If not, get them out of the way. Through whatever means you need to do. But I'm not praying blessings on the wicked. You know, the Bible never tells you to pray blessings on the wicked. This is for you to bless them. Bless those that persecute you. Don't say pray God bless them. I pray God deal with wickedness. 
He removed it out of our ways, right? And I'm telling you, as long as the wicked that are in power in America right now remain in their offices, we will not have quiet and peaceable lives as revivalists in the end times. They're going to do everything they can, but we will have it, but they're going to try to disrupt it. Amen. So the question is, where do we come that we honor wicked leaders? What are the breakdowns for as long as, how do we know what to do? I've had people saying, you know, yes, we should obey Joe Biden. Now, whatever he says, we should do it. It's the law of the land. So here's my question. So if he tells you to give up your guns, are you giving up your guns? No. But it's the law of the land. Yeah, but it's unconstitutional. Amen. How about this? What if they pass a law that you're allowed to have one baby and you have to kill all the other babies that you have? They have to be aborted or executed upon birth. How many are going to obey that? But it's the law of the land in China. You have to abort any other babies you have after the first. So what's going on has been going on for 20 years is if the first baby is found out to be a girl, they abort the girls because they all want boys. Now there's a wife shortage in China. There's a population imbalance because of these stupid laws. So you're going to obey that law? See, there are certain laws that are unconstitutional they may try to pass, and others that are unbiblical. So I've drawn another chart here. Not a chart, just a picture. This is for you to know what to obey. Number one, our order of obedience. How I many know the Bible is number one? Anything that doesn't align with the Bible, I will not obey, including dishonoring Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Amen. And I will say Merry Christmas wherever I go, wherever, whenever I want to say it. I'll start saying it in July. <laughs> Just to rile up devils. Amen. <laughs> so everything we do should be aligned with the Bible. As Americans, what we obey, any law should be aligned with the Constitution. If it's not aligned with the Constitution, it's an inappropriate, illegal law. And I don't care how many Supreme Court justices they dig up from the pit of hell to, you know, pack the court with, no matter what they say, if it's unconstitutional now, they're not changing it. If they change the Second Amendment, say so we're doing away with that, I'm still biding by the Second Amendment. The wicked will not change the standards we live by. And then third, so we obey the Bible, then the Constitution. And how many know our Constitution is based on the Bible? Our forefathers, the founders of this nation, based the Constitution on the Bible. And set up a capitalistic system based on how the Bible says we're to function as a society. <laughs> and then our political leaders, how many know they're supposed to align their laws with the Constitution? So the order of flow is we obey the Bible, the Constitution, and political leaders or laws they pass. But if political leaders do not align their decisions with the Constitution, is therefore an unlawful order. And if they change the Constitution, that it doesn't align with the Bible, that's fighting against God. And we do not obey those unlawful orders. Amen. And we know not yet what's going to come down the pipe. But the enemy is going to try something. Keep a tight grasp on your speedboat ticket. It's about to get exciting. We're about to get on that roller coaster ride. And there'll be flips and somersaults. I remember the first time. I remember the first time that I rode the beast in Kings Island. You ever ride the beast? 
and it's going up this hill. I've never been on a big roller coaster. Just moved to Kentucky. We went up there for a trip. We're all getting on this roller coaster, and I'm, I'm on freak-out mode. It's going <laughs> click, click, click. And I'm going, get me off here. Stop the ride. I don't want to go up this. I, I'm seeing the other side. No, I don't want to do this. It sounds ridiculous for a 23-year-old, but I didn't like it. <laughs> and it finally comes over that hilltop. It takes off flying. And it was about halfway through the ride, I think I quit screaming. I don't know. I didn't scream, but I wasn't like, my God, I'll never do this again. By the time it finished, I was ready to ride again. But then they put in that right up there, the vortex. It was not very long, like two minutes long. Not a very long ride. But it had two loops, still does, I guess, still there. I've not been there in years. And like three barrel rolls. And I remember getting on that. And it went whoop, 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 whoop. And I didn't know where I was. <laughs> but after I rode it, I was like, that wasn't bad at all. Wasn't that bad? But during the ride, I was totally disoriented. And God's about to get us on this roller coaster ride. You better trust the designer with it. Trust where you're going. Amen. And I got to the place. I remember IBM had family day where they would open the park two hours early. Remember those? Two hours early for the employees. And me and whoever I was with, we go straight to the vortex and ride nothing but the vortex until we couldn't take it anymore. There was one time I got on it strict six straight times. They got where they wouldn't even make us get off because there was no line. We just stay on it, take off again. Woo -woo. And, and I remember after six times, I felt like I'd been through a blender. I walked around like this all the rest of the day, I think. Just scrambled my brain for that day. But I got used to it where it was like fun. I'm telling you, when you realize God's got your back, we're going to celebrate. No matter what happens around us, no matter what they say, we're going to have the time of our lives. Because we know no weapon formed against us shall prosper. Right? Now, on the back of your ticket, if you look at it, I've written a set of verses. I would like to take some time to read through some of these. And... uh See what we're promised on this roller coaster ride. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Revelation, I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13. There is no temptation taken you, but such is common, but such is common to man. But God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above that which you are able. But with the temptation also will make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. That sounds like it's still going to stretch us to the breaking point. And in some cases, we experience those things. How many have been in a, in a, in a believing God for something you felt like you were going to break? There are people breaking left and right, right now with the election, giving up their stand, saying, well, we need to submit now to wickedness. I will never break to that. But on this motorboat, it's not going to be just endurance. What God showed me was a party. In fact, I labeled it on your ticket. It says party boat. It's not going to be a hardship. It's going to be a great, great joy. Second Thessalonians chapter 3. Now, of course, the most powerful passage regarding his promises of motorboat life is in Psalm 91. We printed out the entire Psalm 91 on the back of your ticket. We probably won't go there today, but uh, that's something you should be reading every day. Just read it where you can recite it, where you can quote it. Because that virtually is the gist of your motorboat ride. Second Thessalonians 3, verse number 3. But the Lord is faithful who will establish you and keep you from evil. In the, I believe it was the ESV version that says, but the Lord is faithful and he will strengthen you and protect you from the evil one. The devil can't touch a hair on your head on that motorboat. He can't keep up with you. Amen.
Let's go to uh, Isaiah 41. Now, we could fill this ticket with different scriptures. I didn't even go into the ones of individual, other than Psalm 91, of individual attributes of our protection, of our blessing. Amen? We don't have Isaiah 54, 17 on there. No weapon for me gets you to prosper. But we know these things, right? Every good promise of the word belongs to us. Isaiah 41 Powerful verse. Verse 10. Fear thou not, for I'm with thee. Right now, if you're experiencing fear, you better arrest that. It will erode your faith. Be not dismayed, for I'm thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee, yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. God's not going to let you sink. You have got the best life preserver on in the world. And as I said before, this boat runs like a Boston whaler. Remember the Boston whaler boats? You can cut it in two and it'll st both halves will float. We're not going down. I, uh, regarding people that are starting to waver, there's a few that have been in the forefront of proclaiming God's going to give the election to President Trump that are folding. And I noticed one in particular folding a month ago. And I said, he's starting to fold because he's watching too much of the media. He's taking in too much. He's trying to keep up with what's going on. So all he's doing is watching the media. And because he's taking in so much of the wrong inputs, it's over, it's, how can I say it? It's overwhelming his spiritual. What's the word I want? Uh, sensitivity, uh, inspiration, revelation, revelation. The natural is overriding the supernatural. And now he's totally done a flip-flop where he's saying, now we got to wait till the next election. Next election, they've already found out they can cheat. Yeah, yeah. They want to make mail-in voting a constitutional, you know, right now. Yeah. Except the unions, they don't want, they don't want mail-in voting. Because, did you see that? The unions came out, I believe, yesterday. I've got to do something with this thing flipping on me. Came out yesterday and said they don't want mail-in voting for the union elections because people can cheat. <laughs> <laughs> Where were you yeah. a year ago when they were coming up with this? God's going to deal with this stuff. But you not, you must make sure if you're going to be on the boat, you watch the right preparation programming. Amen? Watch the right shows. And you should thank me right now because I just resisted giving you a pinball example. <laughs> Psalm 5. Right, let's take a trip through some of the psalms here. Psalms 5, and go to verse number 11. But let all those that put their trust in thee rejoice. Let them ever shout for joy because thou defendest them. Let them also that love thy name be joyful in thee. For thou, Lord, will bless the righteous with favor and will compass him as with a shield. God's got our backs. Amen. I, tell you, I want to go somewhere else. Just feel led to go here. Go to Mark chapter 4. And we've got this whole set of verses you can go to and read. See what belongs to you as a ticket holder. Here's what I want everybody to do today. If you have Facebook or any social media, go online and take a picture of you holding your ticket. You say, I have a ticket. Amen. Grace Georgetown gave me a ticket. Mark chapter 4, 
Now, in Mark chapter 4 is the story or the parable of the, of the sower, right? Remember the parable of the sower? We're sowing seed and it falls on all types of soil. Based on the soil, it brings forth a harvest. Some is trampled down, other brings forth a fruitful, hundredfold return. Then Jesus from that starts teaching about how seed works. That you plant it, you go to sleep night and day, and it springs up of itself, right? The earth brings forth the fruit, first the blade, then the ear, then the full corn in the ear. And then you start talking about faith being as a type of mustard, as a seed that brings forth the mustard tree. And he's talking about seed all the way through chapter four. But if we go over to verse number 35, and the same day, the same day when he's been teaching all day on seed. Do you follow me? Now, what does the seed produce in us? Faith. Faith comes from a hearing and hearing, right? They've been all day hearing about how faith works. Now comes the test whether they can apply this faith they just learned. So the same day when the even was come, now it's getting dark. Sound familiar? Things are darkening. Good thing we live in Goshen. The Bible says when darkness came on Egypt, there was light in Goshen. He saith unto them, let us pass over unto the other side. Now what did Jesus say? We're going yonder. Now, if Jesus said we're going yonder, where are they going to end up at? Yonder, right? And when they had sent away the multitude, now get this, who got sent away? The multitude represents those that are on the fence. Those that come to hear a, a little, you know, tickling ear and want a free meal. Remember the 5,000? Got a free meal and then you ran them off because he said, you just want the food. The multitudes are those that are really don't have a relationship with God. They just like to hear some nice tidbits. And he sent them away. And they took him even as he was in the ship. And there were also with him other little ships. Now it's interesting, it says he took them even, they took him even as he was. I believe that really represents, they didn't really rep know who Jesus was yet. This is early in his ministry. And they took him as just a normal man getting in the boat, speaking normal human words. Let's go to the other side. They did not recognize the supernatural content in what he said. Amen. So they get into the boat and they invite Jesus in. Be sure Jesus is in your boat. You need Jesus in your boat. And there were also with him other little ships. Now we're going to see the storm arises, right? The storm arises and they think the boat's going to sink. We'll read this in a minute. And Jesus in their boat calmed the storm. But did you know it had a ripple effect? Because with them were other ships. It wasn't just them. There were others got on other boats. See, those closest to Jesus had him in the boat. But others said, let's go along too. Let's get in this boat and follow along. But they didn't know Jesus yet, didn't have him in the boat. They were dependent upon what took place in the remnant speedboat. But what took place in the remnant speedboat had the power to deliver them. Because everybody was in the storm. And everybody experienced the peace. But the peace came out of the boat that had Jesus in it. So what I'm getting at is this ride we're about to take is not just about us. Not just about you. It's going to have a ripple effect and affect many people. Because they're going to see what happens in our boat. And they're going to go get a ticket. Amen. If there was fear in the disciples' boat, what do you think was happening in the others? Terror. They had no alternatives. They couldn't go wake up Jesus. And there arose a great, a mega storm, storm of wind. We've been hearing about wind, right? 
and the waves beat into the ship so that it was now full. The boat's filling up with water. Amen. Somebody needs to do something. What do they need to do? Somebody needed to use their faith they'd learned about all day and speak peace. Amen. <laughs> they heard about it all day. Yeah. Nothing will be impossible to you, basically. And they go straight into fear. Straight into, into nearly terror. And he, Jesus, was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. Yeah, yeah my pillow. <laughs> Mike Lindale, when we were in Washington, D.C., we were walking back to the car. He rode right by us. He was on, a, I think, a bicycle. Went right by us or whatever. Bicycle or car. I didn't see him. The guy said, there's Mike Lindale. And I was busy trying to find directions of the car on my device. The time I looked up, he was gone. But he was there. Asleep on a my pillow, And they awake him and say to him, Master, I need to write the end of my I'm going to write my pillow in my... <laughs> Master, carest thou not that we perish? Does that sound like faith? Does that sound like they're banking on trusting a word from God to take them through? See, on that motorboat we're going to be on, there's no, there's no guarantee it won't hit some waves. But based on your faith level, it will determine whether you're, you have peace in it or not. Or whether you're in terror. Jesus, wake up, come and help us. And he arose and rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. And he said unto them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? Now, some would say, Well, you said the speedboat was going to be a joy. It's going to be fun. Yeah, you know why? Because we've been spiritually prepping. Yes. Prepping. Prepping. <laughs> We know how to say peace be still. Try it once. Peace be still. You know how to speak to the wind. You know how to speak to your situations. Now, Pastor Nancy gave a, gave a prophecy at the beginning of service before we were filming or taping or whatever you call it now, streaming. And she said that God's about to release power like we never imagined that we'll do feats we never thought we could do. To paraphrase. And one of those may be Saying, peace be still. Now I've spoke before and watched the weather change right in front of me. I've watched, I've watched the rain front coming right at me. Had all these experiential materials on the ground. I said, God, don't let it rain. Not on this. And I watched the rain forming a square around the property it was on. It did not rain on that property. I've done that. Amen. But we're going to see greater things than that take place. Instead of freaking out when we hit this big wave, we're going to celebrate and say, "Hey, let's go for a, let's go for an air ride now," because God said we're going to the other side. Was there any way that boat was going to sink? Well, if it did, one would be still sleep on a pillow on top of the water. <laughs> Do my pillows float? <laughs> Jesus was not going to die there. It wasn't what the plan was. And God's got a plan for us. And those that be of faith will have the time of their lives on that boat. You'll not only have Jesus on the boat with you, he's in you. He's decreeing through you. And it's going to be the most exciting time we've ever known. I don't know about you. Let me ramble for just a minute because that's all I have. I've always been earlier in my life, somewhat of an adrenaline junkie. They've always told me I was so laid back. I was, If I was any more laid back, I'd be comato comatose. <laughs> Amen. Well, I'm, I'm not hyper, put it that way. That's what I mean. But I'd get off, I'd get off on adrenaline. You know, let's jump off this bridge. Let's see how fast this car will go. Can we jump this on the motorcycle? <laughs> Something to for excitement. Anybody else like that? Any other adrenaline junkies in here? I did not bungee jump, but I would have skydived. 
I don't trust those bungees as much. I heard about the tennis shoes coming off before. I love that rush of something exciting. The roller coasters and stuff. Loved it once, you know, I quit screaming. <laughs> and I'm going to love being on a boat because you talk about an adrenaline rush, we're going to live in it. We're going to live in this place of just, yay, wee! Glory to God. And uh, it's about to happen. I don't know the flow, the path, but we know that God said he was going to accelerate all things. I believe the motorboat ride is going to accelerate. I believe the wickedness of the evil leaders of the country right now, they're going to be exposed to a level of acceleration we've never dreamed. And I believe they'll be dealt with an acceleration. But in the meantime, we're going to ride the boat. It's accelerating. Take the time to spiritually prep. Take some of these passages on the back of the card, even Psalm 91, and keep speaking it over your life. Memorize it. Get it where you're confident that God, as he said, he'll give his angels charge over you to bear you up on all your ways, lest you, lest you dash your foot against a stone. Bear you up on angels' wings, right? Eagles' wings. Because that's that's the true passage for a motorboat ticket. If you have one of these, say somebody gets a hold of one of these that doesn't really believe and hadn't spent any time learning faith, that's not going to get you on the boat. This is just something to keep us focused. What gets you on the boat is having what's on the back of the card ingrained within you. And that's going to get you there. And that place where you... You come into a relationship with Jesus. If you're out there right now and you don't know Jesus, or maybe you have a surface relationship, it's time to, to get down on your knees and say, Jesus, come into my life. I confess I'm a sinner. Forgive me, the, forgive me these sins. I receive you not just as a Savior, but as Lord. Guide me, direct me. And then dive into the Word and find out what God has for you. Fill yourself with the right inputs. Turn off the television, unless it's Victory TV. And fill yourself with the Word of God. Ask God to fill you with the Holy Spirit. Connect you with the right church. And even if you are in a church, you, you would say, well, I am born again. But you've been lethargic in your spiritual pursuits. Repent. It's better to be cold or hot than to be lukewarm. Because so many coal can be illuminated and get hot. Because God wants us on fire for Him. But the lukewarm think they're okay and they're satisfied with just being where they're at. Never be satisfied where you're at. Always want more of God. Amen? Did you get anything out of this this morning? Time to give our lives to Christ. Time to be part of the end time harvest. Watch what miracles God's going to do in your life. Amen? Father, we thank you in this church. There are none sick, none in pain, none experiencing COVID-19. Everyone healed, strengthened, refreshed, and energized. We have the joy of the Lord and the peace that passes knowledge. In this church, there's no oppression, no anxiety, no fear. We bind fear in every form. In fact, we bind and break off every curse on anyone's life that's coming to this church. Any familiar spirits are broken off and they fall off. In Jesus' name, we step into a new place of liberty in the spirit. This church, there's no lack of anything we need, including deliverance. And there's no strife, no undercutting, no backbiting, no running for cover. We run to Jesus. We thank you, give you praise in Jesus' name. So be it. Amen and amen.